Hi, Marcus. Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Thank you for being here today. Well, thank you so much, Autism Know No Borders and Ms. Rachel for having me on this amazing platform. Could you please briefly introduce yourself? Hi, I am Marcus Leonardo Boyd. I am a four-time Autism Activist Award winner. I am um, a clothing line owner of the A Collection. I am a professional DJ. I am a celebrity interviewer. I am a music producer, composer for almost 21 years. I play eight instruments, make 18 different genres of music. Um, I didn't start talking until I was 13, 13 and a half at a two year old's level. I had severe autism. Um, I still have autism at almost 38 years old. So that's why I became an activist almost three years ago because I wanted to be able to spread my testimony and to be able to help spread more of inclusion and awareness for autism. Great. Yeah, we have a lot to talk about today. We do. We do. It's kind of a lot. It's kind of a lot. Let's start with your childhood. What was it like for you growing up? You said that you didn't start talking until you were 13 years old. Yes, ma'am. Um, it was, <laughs> I mean, there was some positive sides. It wasn't all negative. It wasn't. It wasn't at all negative. Um, but the, when it was negative, it was compact. It was compact on negativity. It was negativity, negativity. It was tumultuous. It was childhood abuse. It was mentally, emotionally, um, sexually. Um, it was abuse. And mm -hmm. It was very bad. It was 16 different mental institutions. It was electrical shock therapy. It was um, forcing me to take pills. It was Ritalin, Paxil, Depakote, Lympium, Seroquel, Zoloft. I mean, it was 500 to 1,000 milligrams a day, two to three pills a day. Um, so it was a it, it was a lot. I mean, six, 17 different foster homes, four or five group homes, three or four different emergency children's shelters. I mean, we talk about two or three states. I mean, it was it was a lot. Mm -hmm. And me not being able to verbalize made it much worse. Yeah. So what led you to be in those situations? Um, that's a good question. That's a good question. You, want to, you might want to mark that down as a star behind that. <laughs> um, I think for me, um, I think that my biological father didn't understand uh, mental mental situations um, or mental or or the way that or the way that you think when you're dealing with those type of situations. I think he wanted a son that he can show off: baseball, basketball, football, the normal man stuff. Um, not a son that's using a bathroom on himself or having a tantrum tantrum or having an emotional um, behavior or scratching or biting people or, um, you know, making obsessive loud noises and different things of that nature. I think for him, it became an embarrassment point because he couldn't take me to the park and do the normal father son things. Um, so when he broke my ribs when I was five in two different places, and, um, you know, I think for him, he was trying to do God's work. Let's take him out of here. Mm -hmm. So I don't have to deal with it. I have other children. So they don't show those signs. They're not doing A, B, and C. Why do I have to deal with this from this one child? So I think that's how I got into it because, you know, I was tragically and horribly abused as a child. Mm -hmm. So from that point, when did you start living in foster homes and group homes? Um, 1987. I was four. 1987. So you have to understand in the state of Georgia, foster care really was not a big thing, but it was like a thing. And in the Cab County, it didn't, it didn't exist at all. So a young lady, a young, she had to be like three, four years old. She was in foster care already in the Cab County. So I was the second one. So that made me the first male to be in foster care in DeKalb County, in Decatur, Georgia. And um, so my social worker, she was an intern, Dr. Carr. She was an intern at the time. And it just so happenedly, she was my biological mother's uh, best friend from college. So like, you know, 
when this stuff was going on, you know, when I was getting burnt on the stove, when my ribs was getting broke, when, you know, when I was getting stumped, when blood and this stuff was coming out of my mouth at four or five years old, you know, she, Dalton Carl was the one that got the emergency contact through the hospital because, you know, if something happens to me, she was my godmother. You know, mm-hmm. you understand what I'm saying? But she was just interning to be a social worker for the Cab County defects, you know, the Cab Family Children's Services. You know what I'm saying? So um, it just so happened that God put an angel to protect me through the storm. Mm. Yeah, that's a lot to deal with at such a young age. I mean, for anyone really at any at any age. How did you cope with all of the abuse that was going on? I didn't really understand it. I didn't really understand it. That's just to be quite honest, if I can be honest. I didn't really understand it because my, my whole thing is this. You know, I'm, I'm seeing fathers and mothers pick up their kids from school. You know, we're talking about 87, you know what I'm saying? Daycare and stuff of that nature. I'm seeing this stuff and I'm not understanding why I got to go home to the people I got to go home to. That's the only thing I was thinking. Like, I didn't know if God made a mistake, like when he was issuing out parents or something like that. I didn't know he probably just wrote my name down too fast or something. I never understood why he gave gave me the parents he gave me if they didn't want the person that I was. Mm. Okay, so take us through the next few years of your life. Okay. Ah, uh, <laughs> okay, so from... Five, six, seven years old, we talking about in and out of multiple foster homes all the time. So um, I may be in one foster home three weeks, one foster home two weeks, one foster home two months, one foster home three months, one foster home 30 days. I mean, it it, it all depends because with each situation, I think Dr. Carr was overprotective because with each situation, every time she did a family home check visit, it was something wrong. Um, especially the foster home that I first got into with the Jamaican family. And when they was tying me to an old heat furnace with honey rope and, um, you know, they was using a miniature 12 gauge to hit on the left side of my face. And when he used to, the father used to spit on me and curse in his language and stuff of that nature. So I was tied up every day for two hours. So I think when Dr. Carr came for the home visit and she knew, see, I stayed with Dr. Carr. So I stayed with her family. I stayed with her three kids. I stayed with her husband. So this is, was before she actually got hired as a social worker with defects. So I was, I was there for almost a year. So she knew my patterns. She knew, you know, how to talk to me, how to communicate with me, even though I couldn't verbalize. So she was one of those people that was patient, kind, understanding, and meek. So. Um, when I get in this Jamaican home, my attitude changed. The noises change, the sound effects changes, the characteristics change because I'm in danger. And I don't know how to verbalize that or speak it outward that I'm in danger. So, you know, when the family had to do the family um, self-check with Dr. Carr and stuff of that nature, she knew when she looked at my face that something was terribly wrong. Mm. So basically, what I'm gonna put in my book, you know what I'm saying, is going we're gonna start that next year. But you know, I ain't gonna tell that story. But in the long run, in the long story short, she got me out of there. She got me out of there. Yeah. Did things get better as you progressed through middle school and high school? No, it got worse. <laughs> it got worse. Because by that time, okay, we're talking about middle school, um, middle of middle school. In a middle school, start of high school, I had to be like, phew, like seven, eight, maybe nine mental institutions by then. We're talking about one or two inpatient charter type um, facilities. Um, we're talking heavily medicated, heavily dosed on medication. We're talking about a 24 hour therapy sessions with Verda Looper, that was my therapist. We're talking about Dr. King trying to fluctuate my medical medicine situations at that time. So, and then I was having real severe, real severe behavior problems. So, no, nah, then it wasn't a light then. It was not a light. Mm-hmm. Were you ever placed in a stable family home? Um, for about two, three years, I was with the Barneses, Jackie and Benny Barnes. 
um, in Decatur, Georgia and stuff of that nature. So, you know, to this day, they still mom and pop. Their children still my brothers and sisters. You know what I'm saying? To this day, we matter of fact, we sort of be doing something um, on Zoom for Thanksgiving this year. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, they taught me values and structure. They taught me about Jesus and Christ. They taught me about patience and understanding. And most importantly, they taught me about forgiveness. Because if I carry the burdens of my past, I can never see the light of my future. Mm -hmm. Is that what ultimately helped you heal through all of this? That and music. Music mm -hmm. was my, and still is my, my go-to. It was, it's my soft point. It's my calm place. It's my peace. So that's why I got seven, eight different headphones because music is my, is my go-to. Without music, I don't know where would I be. Yeah. And before we talk about your music career, I just want to get a little bit more understanding about your autism. Yes, ma'am. So when were you eventually diagnosed? Was it with this family that they were able to take you to a doctor? No, it was okay. with my, it was with, well, yes and no. Because um, Jackie Barnes' mother, which I call my grandmother, but that's technically my foster grandmother. But um, April 12th, 1993, I was 10. Mm -hmm. Dr. King at Clifton Springs Mental Health Center said that I had classic autism and I had severity in points of language, communication, behavior, my character and how I operate. And I don't think on a regular individual's level as far as comprehension, um, as far as following direction, as far as understanding um, my outbursts and my behaviors normally lasts between 30 to 35 to 40 minutes. And I don't know how to come back from having an outburst or having a behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so he said that I need to be medicated and put on 500 to 1,000 milligrams of Ritalin. He, wow. said that would, he said that would be my mood stabilizer and that will really help me um, follow key directions that's given. Did it help? Um, it zombified me. Mm -hmm. So, which means that, yeah, I follow whatever anybody say, and I do mean anybody say, instead of following the directions of the person that's giving the direction. You could have told me to jump off of a bus, would have did it with no arguments, no hesitations, nothing. It puts you in a place to where that you really can't function and think for yourself. It actually almost like, thinks and moves for you because there's no self-will. Your self-will is taken away. When you take Ritalin packs of depth, when you take those type of psychological, psychomatic medications, it it help, it puts you in a place where you only listening and doing not because you want to, because you're forced to. Hmm. Yeah, that could be really dangerous. Yeah, it really can. So what was the turning point that helped you start speaking? Um, okay, so my foster grandmother and my foster sisters, they used to do rituals. So it's just like you probably were seen on movies such as Rain Man, Color Purple, those different type of things as far as sticky notepads, um, notebook paper, um, writing things down, making me sound it out, um, you know, flashcards, different things of that nature. We're talking about a repetitiveness. And they even tried Muzzy. They tried Hooked on Phonics. They tried every, you understand what I'm saying? They tried everything. But it's the, with autism people, we live off routine. So it was the routine of it that I got used to. It's the way they were speaking to me that made me more comfortable. Mm -hmm. And when they used to give me rewards every time I did a task, it made me want to do more tasks because I wanted more rewards. So we're talking about six, seven, maybe eight, nine years. It was competitive. It was excessive. It was every hour, every 30 minutes, every 35 minutes. Go ahead and take a five to 10 minute break. But even if you have to yell this out, even if you can't speak it out, we're going, we, we going back in. This is what you have to do because we believe that you more than what the doctors say you are. Yeah, that's actually really beautiful. They they didn't give up on you. Yeah, they did. And, you know, I owe them what I am today. I owe God what I am today, but I owe them as an individual what I am today. Mm -hmm. 
And when did you discover your own autism? Um, I think I had to be like 18, 19 years old. And I started seeing that if I'm standing in a line at McDonald's and I hear laughter or whatever, I would try to jump on the person that's laughing because I think they was laughing about me. Not necessarily saying that they knew me or, or they was talking about me. It's just the inner thought that I was having in my head that they was laughing and joking about Marcus. So I had to defend myself. So mm-hmm. I, I realized that something was really wrong when I was doing or displaying those type of actions. Mm -hmm. Did you have friends at that point? Uh, (laughs) I did have friends. Um, Not a lot of them. Not a lot of them. My friends' stories go in and out. It's like movies. They happen, little action, then we don't be friends no more. It's like, more so like my past relationships. It's like that too. Like, We'll be in a relationship and then you may not want to be able to deal with my behavior. You may not be able to deal with the autism side of things. So you want to move on. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, it's life. Is there anything that you struggle with on your end with social skills? Yes. Um, I still, even though I'm a people's person, some circles I don't like to be around as you know what I mean? As far as communication is concerned, I like better doing video than some personal face to face type of situations because I could be in my comfort zone. I could be in my room or whatever have you in my space. I'm not necessarily in your space and still have to speak to you face to face. So some colors still get to me, even though I'm a music producer, some noises still can be a trigger for me um you know certain foods I still don't eat because of the color texture of the food even at almost 40 years old I don't I think people think that when you become verbal you totally lose autism and that's a myth and that's a lie that's not true you you become verbal God bless you Yes, God is, you know, allowing you to have that step, but you still have autism for the rest of your life. You still need certain people and certain positive auras and things in your corner so you can continue to excel through your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So actually, Marcus, sorry, I want to jump back to the thing you were talking about before about, um, you know, jumping on people's backs and realizing that you were different, right? Mm -hmm. So did someone actually tell you that you had autism? Like, how did you find out? Um, A girlfriend of mine told me that I might have bipolar or I'm schizophrenic at that time. So her father, I guess, was a psych, uh, uh, the psych, psychology or? Psychiatrist. Yes. So he said that I'm not showing signs of schizophrenia. He said he said that he has autism. And he said that he has uh, a behavior case that he don't know how to deal with or he don't know how to control on his own. So we may want to talk about putting him back on some type of medication that can help deal with his um, mood and his temper. And did you go back on medication at that point? I was trying. I was trying. I did. I was trying. That's where Seroquel came in. I was trying. Mm-hmm. First, we started at 50 milligrams. Then went to 100 milligrams. Then it went to 550 milligrams. So, I mean, I mean, you know, based off his recommendation, because he was, you know, a psychologist. Yeah, that word. Psychiatrist. He was that. Yeah. He was a psychiatrist. So, we was basing it off his medical recommendation of my past and current behavior. Mm -hmm. But leading up to that point, did you always feel different? Yeah, because I, you know, people never wanted me to sit with them on the bus. I could never sit with people at lunch because, you know, I'm drooling and, you know what I mean? I'm Mm -hmm. having issues with my bowel movements and stuff of that nature in class or or at lunch. And stuff of that nature. So people was always making fun of me. Nobody wanted to sit next to me. And then the little, again, the little friends I did have, we never had the same lunch. So I would see them beginning of school, at school. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah. no, no passings of the halls because I was in the special education classes and they was in the regular classes. Mm-hmm. So. Right. Okay, Marcus, we actually have a question here from one of our listeners okay. who is also a follower on Instagram. Their handle okay. is at Griffin Autism. And he wants to know, what stereotypes have you come across that aren't true for autistic individuals? Number one, that we're not intelligent. Number two, that we, we're not gifted or we're not creative or we're not, or we can't build things or sing or, 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 or be lawyers or doctors or anything else. Because we have a neurological uh, deficiency or disorder, we, they feel like we won't, we don't know how to count or we don't know how to read or we don't know how to, even in, in our language barrier, we don't know how to communicate. The problem is people don't know how to communicate with us. They haven't found our way to communicate. So because we don't, if we don't verbalize, they feel like that's the only communication we may have. And that's not true. It's millions of many different communication values. I think patience and dedication has to be there first before anybody can be able to understand fully and deal with autism. And I know for myself personally, it was like, oh, well, we just gonna stick him in his classroom with five people. We're not gonna elevate him or challenge him to be anything different because, you know, he got autism. So he's gonna act up this way. We're gonna put him in a timeout room or whatever. So who he didn't nobody knew that I was going to get a degree in journalism and mass communications nobody knew I was going to have 13 music awards or be nominated for a Grammy seven times the thing is is we have to stop putting entitlement and limitations on our children with autism we have to love support them and nourish them and allow them to grow to the flowers that we know I mean that God knows that they're able to become because you got to think about it God put you with this child for a reason so if he puts you with this child, he know what this child's going to become. You just going through the process of finding out. Yeah, that's really powerful. Okay, Marcus, let's talk about your music career. A little bit, a little bit, a yeah. little bit, a <laughs> little bit. So, you know, you said that music was always in your life when since you were a kid, right? And you play yes eight music. Yeah, I went to band camp. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm not American Pie, but I did go to band camp. I did. I mm-hmm. did. It was a church, it was a church um organized band camp. So the you know, little girls on one side, boys on one side, we all ate lunch in the same little wood place. So, you know, I played the tuba and I started with the violin. And every time when you got on the bus, they gave you a free wood flute. Yeah, they was giving out free wood flutes <laughs> back in the day. <laughs> right. Yeah. And what is your favorite instrument now? Trumpet. Okay. Is there a reason for that? There's a trumpet in every genre of music. Versus uh-huh. whether it's a silent trumpet or it's a loud trumpet based off the keynotes. There's a trumpet instrument in every genre of music. Gospel, jazz. I don't care whatever it is. Rock. I don't care whatever it is. There's a trumpet in every genre. You can't live without a trumpet, trumpet and drums. Mm -hmm. Those two things is always needed in music. It's trumpet and drums. Interesting. I never thought about the trumpet like that. Yep. Yep. And it's a conversation piece. Let me tell you something. I am not trying to be funny, but I was not really the ladies man. But when I started (laughs) playing that trumpet, let me tell you you something. Okay. They was leaving notes in my locker. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) All right. And how did you get involved in the music industry? Um, Okay, so I was in Atlanta. I was 15, about to be 16 years old. A cousin of mine knew um, one of the members from Organized Noise and stuff of that nature. You know, those people who produce major people like Outkast, Goody Mob, um, (laughs) you know what I'm saying? Those Mm -hmm. type of people. My cousins was best friends with one of the original members of Organized Noise. So um, when I met him, he gave me an Acer laptop and Fruity Loops 1. I had a demo version of Fruity Loops 1. See, I'm showing my age. I had a <laughs> demo version of Fruity Loops 1. Right now, these kids got what? Fruity Loops 10, 10, XL, 11, whatever. I mean, they might be on 12 now. Who knows? 
<laughs> but back in the day, I had one. So I had to learn how to infuse live instrumentation with digital beats, with BPMs. You understand what I'm saying? Because the beat will always be off from the live instrumentation because you're trying to balance and blend them together. But the, the live trumpet is different from a digital drum. Mm -hmm. The key is, how do you make them sound smooth under the same frequency? When the, K, when the, KQ, when the KQZ is different from each instrument. I don't want to lose you. I don't want to lose you. You're over here. <laughs> you can see my face getting a little, like, interested. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So got it. that's how I got into music, and I was able to produce for, um, at the time, he was a local rapper. He blew up to be a big rapper, but we was all in the same basement. Like, mm. I, didn't, I didn't see him as a big-time rapper, because, like, I, I skipped school. Okay, excuse me, kids. Don't you skip school. Mm -hmm. Don't you do it. You better get your education. But this is just my story. At okay. the time, I skipped school <laughs> to go to the dungeon. So that's where everybody was. It was called the dungeon. You know what I'm saying? So at the local rapper, I didn't know that one of my beats was going to be used for his song. Shoot, they gave me $600, sold your bow jeans, and two passes to Sizzlers. Listen, don't <laughs> sleep on Sizzlers. You know what I'm Listen, if you don't know about Sizzlers, you can get a whole meal for $2.49 with a salad bar. It's that crew in your drink. So I thought that was the biggest thing smoking. They gave me a season pass at Six Flags. I was 15. Mm -hmm. I'm like, <laughs> you can't tell me. What? You gave me a whole season pass. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know the music business. I didn't know that I was going to count me out of my royalties. I didn't know I was going to lose millions of dollars because I signed over my audio masters. Mm. Mm -hmm. See, in this game, in this game, you have to be educated. You can't put talent first because everybody got gifts and everybody got talent, but everybody doesn't know the business. So mm -hmm. learn the business first, then it's, it's, um, show your talent. So as you collaborated with all these different well-known artists over the years, did you disclose your autism to the people you were working with? No, ma'am, I did not. Not and, and, and to the audience of this listening audience, there's nothing wrong with autism. Again, it's not a disease. It's not a disability or anything of that nature. We just learn and look and see things differently and understand things in a different way. Um, at that time, though, I was ashamed. Okay. Because and because I'm I'm looking up to these rappers or these singers. These are superstars in my eyes. So what I'm gonna tell them? Listen, okay. About ten minutes ago, I just had an emotional behavior. So I may not be all the way there and present for your time and your quality. And plus, they was paying me. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I was tired of eating Raymond noodles and pork and beans at that time. So um, and plus, I wanted to be normal. I thought I wasn't normal when I already was normal you understand what I'm saying mm -hmm. peer pressure is uh is a beast it's a beast when you don't have to deal with what we deal with with autism but it's more of a monster when you deal with what we deal with with autism because we we want to be in the, with the peers so right. the pressure can if you're not strong enough the pressure will mount and get you was that tiring for you to hide your autism yes it was Cause it was almost like putting myself in a closet. Like, shh, mm -hmm. don't you say nothing. Don't you, don't you say nothing. Cause I'm trying to, I'm trying to wear this mask and I'm trying to be one way when in my reality, I got this situation in the closet. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. What are some of your strengths related to autism that have helped you become successful as a producer? Um, repetitive, repetitiveness, um, continuing being, doing the same thing over and over and over. Um, it's like that practice part, you mean? Yes. Okay. Listening, constantly, constantly listening, constantly observing and trying to, now as a grown adult, I try to 
take notes and and learn through writing or verbal communication. And it and it really helps. And it really helps because if somebody gives me an instruction, now as an adult, I might ask you 10 times, what'd you just say? And you could be in my face, but it's not the repetitiveness of me asking you the same question. It's me being able to digest and understand it in my brain frame to where I can be able to react and recommunicate to you how I'm going to operate in what you just asked me to do. Mm -hmm. So what made you decide to become an autism advocate and actually start speaking up for what you need? A friend of mine, okay, listen, there's not, I'm not trying to be funny in this story, but it's just real. Um, I was on 285 Highway uh, about almost three years ago in Georgia, Atlanta, stuff like that. Uh, she picked me up. We had to go to a store, a couple of stores, whatever, whatever. So I forgot that her son has autism. He has severe autism. He's nonverbal. So she knew about my autism and she asked me going down the highway, am I going to come to her church that Sunday and tell my testimony about autism? Because there's other parents in her church that she was going to that their kids have autism as well. And I said, no. I said, you out of your mind. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to your church and talk about anything dealing with my testimony. You know, she pulled over her car. Mm -hmm. It was raining. It was pouring down raining. She pulled over her car and told me, get out. Let me tell you something. I'm a big guy, okay? So me walking 30 minutes back, where? I don't know where she, I don't know where, how, how she got on the highway or mm -hmm. where I'm going. It's pouring down raining outside. I mean, pouring. <laughs> so she was like, if you don't want to tell your testimony, she said, how dare you? God allowed you to speak. You educated. You could be worse off than what you are. But you don't want to tell the, the miracles and the blessings of God. You want to keep it in. Mm -hmm. She said, so get out of my car. You're going to walk. Don't contact me. Don't do nothing. I was like, hold on. Flag on the plate. Hold on. Flag. Flag. Hold on. Time. Flag. You do know it's raining outside. I don't care. I don't care. I have to see my son not speak every day. And knowing that I got a, a friend that has the same thing and you speaking and you don't want to speak out for others. I said, listen, okay, well, you, what time your church starts? What time? <laughs> what, what time? What time your church? What time your church starts? Because it really is raining. It really is raining right now. So I didn't know when I went to her church, and I started telling my story that all these people was coming up to me asking questions and different things and looking for advice or whatever. It, the embrace was so powerful and it was so loving. I will never ever forget it. That was almost three years ago. So I made a vow to God myself and her, mm -hmm. that however long that I have on this earth, I will only not only use my testimony, not to, I only use my testimony to bring awareness and inclusion, but I will make up different things like clothing lines, music events, magazines, and everything else to include not only myself, but every autism person worldwide, be able to spread their stories through docu-series and, doc and other documentaries. Because it's not just my voice, it's many other voices that needs to be heard through this community that we live in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and let's talk specifically about the Black community. Okay. So is there any part of your advocacy work aimed to break the stigma of how autism is viewed specifically in the Black community? It's about to start. It has not been in the past but it's about to start. Uh, me and my team, we're getting together. Like I got to um, speak at the NAMI in Durham, North Carolina. That's the National Association of Mental Illness. Um, yeah, in Durham, North Carolina here. And we're going to be um, talking about, and to the sheriff and different police, because they have to understand, number one, all handcuffs is not made for everybody. So you have to be vigilant and know how to use the handcuffs that you are provided with. And you have to understand when a, uh, a autism individual is having a emotional behavior or they are having a tender tantrum or they're having uh, you know, a different way to communicate, that don't mean that you put your handcuffs on them. They don't mean that you tackle them and restrain them. They don't, you have to find a way 
to where they feel comfortable in their communication because they're trying to communicate something to you. You just not understanding it and you feel it to be a threat or to be um, a violation of, of, of maybe a school policy or, or whatever type of policy. So you want to enforce your law. So you want to enforce restraint instead of understanding and communicating to them in the way they can understand. So yes, we're going to start teaching what is what will be called autism police enforcement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is so important because we've talked on this podcast before about the higher risk of people with autism being arrested because of exactly what you're saying. It's like a lack of understanding, really, a lack of training. And I think what you're doing, um, speaking directly to the organizations that need to hear it, um, will just bring about more productive change. Um, another thing me and my team is going to want to present to them is if there's some type of badge or pin that or necklace or something that an autism individual can wear when they're going out to where that the police will see it and know it and recognize it. Like, okay, this is an autism individual because we done seen this logo. We done seen this necklace and stuff of that nature it's in our database system. We understand it. So, you know, I'm not saying that, oh, you shouldn't deal with an autism individual at all when you are police. You just know, need to know the proper ways of dealing with an autism individual when you are a police. Mm -hmm. And stop looking at everybody in the same eye because how they act, another person may not act. And it may be more of a deeper emotional and, and um, deeper emotional reason why the autism individual is acting the way he or she is versus they're trying to commit a crime or versus they're trying to become a um, disturbance. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, Marcus, you released a documentary a couple weeks ago, and the yeah. documentary is titled My First Word. Yes. So tell us about that. Okay, so two, three years ago, so we did a little 20-minute short documentaries on some pieces of my life because I wanted people to understand that as an activist, I'm not just coming off of like, oh, he's an activist. No, I live this. Autism is me and I am autism. Autism can't define me. I define autism. So the thing is, is that I come from this world. I'm not speaking to you because I've done research or I went to school for this or, or something of that nature. This is life for me. What I have learned is to be able to channel my past and my trials and tribulations and have them now be light and a journey guide to others who may be dealing with the same um, things that I have dealt with in my past. Mm -hmm. Can people access the documentary online? Yeah, you go on my Facebook because it's a 20-minute piece, so I can't put it on Instagram, or Twitter, or Snapchat, and stuff like that. But you go on my Facebook, which is Marcus Leonardo Boyd, or you go on my fan page, which is Autism Activist Marcus Boyd, or you go, I mean, is is many ways to see it. Or I put it in your inbox if you want to befriend me on Facebook. I'll slap it dead in your inbox. <laughs> All right. Okay, Marcus, I'd like to close with one last question. Okay. What advice would you give to other people with autism who are interested in pursuing a career in music? Um, number one. Don't let your current situation be your destiny. Use your current situation to define gravity, to define your gift, and to define who you are. Learn the music business. Please learn the business side first. If you play an instrument, if you rap, sing, dance, or whatever, learn the business structure, the modules, the contracts, the managers, producers, PRs, agents, all these different things. Learn the percentages. Learn about CSEC and BMI and ASCAP. Um, you know, learn about the about um, you know, BDS and the, the media base. And you know, learn how to properly, you know, um 
title your music for the meta for the meta data sheets and learn the right people to to connect with and network with please my autism family don't use autism as an excuse not to excel and be great my grandmother always used to say to me what I'm about to say to you don't let your disability make room at anybody else's dinner table. And if two or three are gathered and they have the same excuse, you're eating at the same dinner table. Hmm. I know you can be like great that. and I believe in you. And Marcus loves you. <laughs> Beautifully said. Well, thank you, Marcus. You know, you're quite an inspiration to so many people. Your story is incredible and everything that you've overcome and how you've managed to um, to see another side of it and now use your autism to help other people. It's, it's really, really making a difference in this world. So thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Well, thank you for having me on this amazing platform. And I encourage others who have stories that deal with autism, if you volunteer, if you're a parent, if you are a social worker, if you're a lawyer for those in special needs, whatever your title is, you need to hit up Miss Rachel and you need to hit <laughs> up this platform and allow your stories to be heard. Because remember, we only can teach what we learn. And we're just going to continue to wear, to bring awareness and to change the stigma of how people see autism. Yeah, let's continue collaborating for sure. I'm down. I'm, I'm down, yeah. James Brown. That's all you got to do is email me. I'm down. Yeah. Thank you, Marcus. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Knows No Borders. Despite all odds being stacked against him, Marcus was able to overcome his obstacles with the loving support of his grandmother. His passion for music pushed him to continue reaching for his goals. What left you feeling inspired from listening to Marcus's story? We'd love to hear your thoughts and reflections. Visit our website, autismknowsnoborders.com, and leave a comment on this episode. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comment section. Click here to watch another interview from our podcast. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.